welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our special guest is EWTN chaplain, Father Joseph Mary Wolf, and we'll be talking to him about a book entitled The Enthronement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and it's edited by His Eminence, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, and published by the Marian Catechist Apostolate. Great to have you here, my friend. Good to be with you, Doug. Good to hear. You know, yes. we usually get together at least once a year for the March for Life. Right. And uh, the, the whole March for Life weekend this past year. But here we're talking about something else that's near and dear to your heart, and I guess into our Lord's heart, right? Yes. The Sacred Heart. Yes, I'm very excited about this book. I've done Enthronement of the Sacred Heart in Homes and also for the Sisters a number of years ago and the Friars also have enthroned our Friary to the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. But there was never really a, a book that kind of puts everything together for that, for right. doing that. Well, let me ask you a question. Did Mother have a devotion to the Sacred Heart? Was that something, I mean, you've been here how many years now? Yes, you know, that was even something that began before her religious vocation. Oh, really? Okay. She was helping to spread devotion to the Sacred Heart with these little Sacred Heart badges that she was helping this Monsignor to distribute. And that goes back to St. Margaret Mary Alla Coke, right. who would wear an image of the Sacred Heart over her own heart as a sign of that union of hearts. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you, one of the other um, big devotions, certainly here on EWTN, we have from Stockbridge every year, the sisters do something. Mother was a big, big proponent, certainly, of you know the, the whole idea of divine mercy. We have the chaplet on every day. Uh, it <clears throat> seems similar, but it's different. Maybe you could talk about how they're the same and maybe how they're different. And why do we still need the Sacred Heart if we've got Divine Mercy? Well, I think we can see the similarities that both of them reveal the open heart of Christ. And so the Divine Mercy, He's pouring out the rays of His mercy. And one ray represents baptism and the sacramental life, the other ray. And we also see that in the Sacred Heart image where Christ's heart is open, there's a cross on His heart, there's a crown of thorns there. But I think a distinction that we could see there is that the Divine Mercy devotion is a lot about the floodgates of mercy are being open to sinners if they will turn to the Lord. Of course, that's true in the Sacred Heart as mm -hmm. well. And then we too are to be instruments of mercy in the world. Mm -hmm. The Sacred Heart, I think there's more of an emphasis on this intimacy with the Lord Himself. Mm -hmm. And that's what this image and enthronement of the Sacred Heart in the home that we have this heart-to-heart -heart converse with our Lord. Mm -hmm. He is our King, but He's also our brother, and He's our friend. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting, too, because one of the things I would say, too, is, I mean, obviously, Divine Mercy is very popular now. Sacred Heart is the kind of thing, for myself, growing up, uh, you know, uh, in the 60s and stuff, you kind of heard about it. You might go into somebody's house and see this, this Sacred Heart picture, or mm -hmm. portrait on the wall, but you really haven't heard a lot about the Sacred Heart in probably the last 40 years. Is that fair to say? It really goes back to Father Matteo uh, Crowley Bove. He was a holy missionary, and it was in 1907 that uh, be, he had a number of physical problems, and uh, he was kind of worn out with helping with earthquake recovery actually in his own uh, country in South America. And so he was given permission to go to Père Monial in France, mm -hmm. where the revelations of the Sacred Heart took place. And it was there that he received both a physical healing and an enlightenment that he was to be involved in, in enthroning the Sacred Heart image in homes. Mm -hmm. Because whoever rules the home rules society. The, the home, the family, is the cell of society. It's the domestic church. Right. right, right. So he could see whoever is ruling there is going to rule society. And so he presented this to Pope St. Pius X. And Pope St. Pius X said to him, not only do I give you permission to, the, to do this, but I command you to do this. Consecrate your whole life to this. And right. that's what he did for the rest of his days. Yeah, Pope St. Pius X in 1907 said, to save the families, to save society, the work you're undertaking is a work of social salvation. Consecrate your life to it. That's okay. It's interesting because it says here that Father Matteo insisted on the official and social recognition of the rule of the Sacred Heart of Jesus over the Christian family. What do you mean official and social? It was something that was to be done publicly. So 
It wasn't just some sort of hidden thing, but you're going to do a public act. So it wasn't like a private devotion in a sense, not that it's not, but it's be something. So the enthronement is something that's done publicly in a sense. Right. As far as you do it as a whole family. Mm -hmm. So it involves the entire family. It's not just one of the members of the family, but the whole family uh, does this enthronement. And the father is the head of the family, is typically the one who will place that Sacred Heart image in the place that's going to be honored. And, and we'll talk about, and what's great about this book, it gives you a little bit of the history, it talks about the actual revelations, and it also tells you how the whole process for the enthronement goes. Right. Uh, but one of the things that struck me, it said, uh, the enthronement and single persons, and it says the person living alone no less than a household family rightly desires the Christ to be his or her constant companion. So, I mean, is it fine for a single person who's living by themselves? But what if I'm living in a household where the other people, let's say, in the household aren't Catholic, they're not as Catholic, let's say, as I am, they're not interested in this mm -hmm. devotion. Can you? Can I enthrone my room or enthrone my life inside a larger house, or does it need to be the whole household? Of course, ideally, you want the whole home to be enthroned to the Sacred Heart and all of the members involved in that. Um, but there's nothing that would keep a person from, like you said, enthroning his own room. But I sa as I said, it's p typically something that is publicly mm -hmm. done as far as you invite friends, uh, you invite a priest if he's available. The head of the family can do this enthronement, you know, on his own. Yeah, I noticed uh, in the back there's actually some certificates, uh, right. I guess, for the enthronement. And I did notice in that that it did list it could be a priest, deacon, or a quote-unquote leader, which I guess would be the, the head of the house. Okay. So again, it's something that you're publicly doing just like when we as religious make our public vows or as priests that we make our commitment to the church, there's actually a public ceremony where we are signing a document acknowledging what we are doing. Okay, so that's and so in this case, we're saying Christ is going to be right. the king of our lives and of our home. Now, since you've been doing it, have you seen the positive impact on the families who've had their houses enthroned? Yes, and uh, in fact, Gloria Anson, mm -hmm was a woman that's been, and she was involved in the Scranton um, 100th anniversary event, and she has gone around all over the world uh, promoting devotion to the Sacred Heart, and she talked about her own family. She didn't even know what the Sacred Heart enthronement was, but it was going to be done in their home, and she immediately noticed a change in the atmosphere of the home, she mm -hmm. said, and that when they had difficulties, they would just instinctively go where the image of the Sacred Heart was. And she found it especially a, a consoling place just to have that heart-to-heart -heart converse with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So she said, you know, she noticed the atmosphere in her home change as she saw her husband and her children there kneeling as they're doing the enthronement and making this consecration prayer that she said, we asked Jesus to come and he showed up. Right, <laughs> you know? right, right. right. It's interesting too because I think in terms of mother in a sense when she started a religious catalog, the whole concept of the holy reminders, the idea of getting those sacred images, the statues and those things back in our homes, in our mm -hmm. daily life. This is a higher level of that. But again, mm -hmm. that reminds us of the eternal, it reminds mm -hmm. us of our Lord. And one of the things here, right at the beginning, uh, Cardinal Burke, who, who, who wrote the introduction, kind of said, uh, devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is most effective means of living always in the company of our Lord Jesus, whom we receive in Holy Communion. So he ties it to the, to the Eucharist. But then he also talks about in his fourth apparition, our Lord's to St. Margaret Mary, he talks about the whole idea of the heart, which has so loved men that it spared nothing, even going so far as to exhaust and consume itself to prove them its love. And this was what was interesting. And in return, I received from the greater part of men nothing but ingratitude by the contempt, irreverence, sacrilegious, and coldness with which they treat me in this sacred sacrament of love. So mm -hmm. our Lord is not pleased all the time with how we're responding to Him, His love, and, and to some degree, I guess, the Eucharist, right? Yes, in fact, there's a, a tying, really, with the Sacred Heart image in the home, tying that in a way, it's a, it's a link, if you will, to the tabernacle in the parish church. It's also been described as that. When we go to Mass, mm -hmm. that's our highest prayer, that's our highest encounter with the risen Lord and with His Sacred Heart. But we don't want that just to remain there for one hour a week, if we're just going to Mass one a week, one day a week. But we want that to be something continual, this devotion, this union with our Lord and with His heart. And so this devotion to the Sacred Heart, as Cardinal Burke says, is a way that we can live that you know, throughout the day. Right, and he goes on to say here that the, 
the enthronement includes necessarily our consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and the consecration is a quote-unquote setting apart, a formal dedication of oneself to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And there's actually a whole act of consecration that's included in here, and it tells you how one would go about and do the enthronement. When was the first time you actually consecrated yourself to the Sacred Heart? Mm, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the actual date. If you do it once, do you have to do, <clears throat> do it ongoing, or is it something one, one time for all, or how does that work? There is an act of renewal. It's actually in that book, and it's mm -hmm. recommended that you would make a renewal annually from the day that you enthroned your home, or on special days like the Feast of the Sacred Heart or your own birthday, special days on my own ordination card, mm -hmm. I chose as the image, the image of the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. So I think that was in a particular way when I just consecrated my priesthood. And Cardinal Burke also has in there the 12 promises of the Sacred right, Heart. Right, exactly. And I like especially the 10th one. Okay. Do you have that there? I will give to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. Right. So I put a lot of confidence in that, that a devotion to the Sacred Heart is going to make me more effective as a priest in being able to touch hearts or be the Lord's instrument in touching those hearts. Well, let's talk about those listed uh, right in the beginning here is the summary of the promises of the Sacred Heart, <laughs> and there were actually 12 <clears throat> promises. Uh, let's run through a couple that people might be aware of. I will give them all the graces necessary for their state of life. I will give peace in their families. I will console them in all of their troubles. So those certainly sound so, like pretty good yes. things to get. Number seven, tepid souls shall become fervent. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, I will bless the homes in which the image of my sacred heart shall be exposed and honored. I'm just jumping around. Number 11, those who propagate this devotion shall have their name written in my heart and shall never be effaced. And then you get down to uh, number 12, the all-powerful love of my heart will grant to all those who shall receive Holy Communion. This is what I remember as a kid. Mm -hmm. Holy Communion on the first Friday, there's first Friday. Right. So this ties into first Friday. Right. Okay, people hear about first Friday. Of nine consecutive months, the grace of final repentance, they shall not die under my displeasure. Yeah, I remember as a kid, the nuns would take us every, we'd have first Friday, we'd mm -hmm. go to Mass every Friday, and the idea was, at least simplistically, that if you went nine times, mm -hmm. nine in a row, you didn't miss any, and you went to, had a confession ahead of time, and we went to communion, you were guaranteed salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that wasn't quite right, but <clears throat> it's something like that. Yes, and it's that devotion that you have, you know, that the Lord remembers that commitment that you made. And so He's going to give you every grace that you need for your salvation. Of course, you can always reject that. Mm -hmm. You know, we can choose the Lord and people do that. They, they have an experience where they choose the Lord, mm -hmm. but we remain free. Right. The Lord's going to be faithful to His part. Right. And we see that in the Old Testament, too, how the Lord is always faithful. But not always people responded in fidelity always to Him. Mm -hmm. So He's going to be faithful to us. He's going to give us all the graces that we need. Mm -hmm. But we're free so that we, could, we can reject them, hopefully never but that uh, we will correspond with those graces. Right. In fact, on page 55 is the <coughs> indulgence <coughs> prayer. And so that it's actually an indulgence that you get for this then, if you go to the nine times? That prayer itself, yes, I guess it has special uh, indulgence uh, attached okay. with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about, and this is something else that I was thinking, the whole concept of enthronement, Christ is king. Uh, <coughs> you know, during the 60s and the 70s, and which I'm old enough to remember, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this whole idea of the king and all this kind of medieval and, you know, we're kind of leaving all that stuff behind. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there was some of that of why the whole kingship of Christ was kind of played down and maybe even the whole idea of, I'm mean, enthroning the sacred heart, this seems kind, kind of right. not in step with where the <clears throat> church is today? And kind of against our American mentality, because we rejected right. the right. rule <laughs> of a king. That's right, that's true. Right. But the difference with Christ's kingship, which we celebrate every year, as a reminder that He is the king. He's right. the over, Right before Advent, really. Right. <laughs> right. So. He's over every leader. Uh, any authority has to realize that they themselves are subject to a higher authority, to God, to Christ, who is the king of the universe. But in Christ's case, He's a benevolent ruler. Mm -hmm. We know that we hear the sad stories of dictators and tyrants in the past 
who ruled just wanting their own mm -hmm. will to be imposed on people. But Christ comes quite differently, that he comes as a servant. He comes to save. Mm -hmm. And so he comes to invite us to life and life abundant. So he's quite a different, you know, the best rule that we could have would be a benevolent monarch who had our, our best uh, intentions in mind. Mm -hmm. Now in the enthronement section it says, the Sacred Heart is enthroned in a prominent place in the home. It is also praiseworthy when carried out in a church, school, business, or other area of human activity. Now, all there's hymns in here. There's the whole act of enthronement. Uh, there's some prayers. Now, I also notice there's a trigium for the enthronement in the home. So, does it take three days to have it enthroned? Yes, if you're going to do anything of value, mm -hmm. it requires some preparation. Okay. You know, if we're going to do a good program on EWTN, well, Mother was maybe an exception to this, but, but she, <laughs> she had was years. the only. <laughs> yeah, the exception proves the rule. But she had years of preparation of teaching people, right. and so it wasn't something that she was unfamiliar with when she came out here and she taught. And if we're going to do something like we're really going to enthrone Christ as the King of our home and our, our lives, mm -hmm. then we need to prepare for that. We need to think about it. We need to read the, the Gospels and uh, to prepare that God will give us special graces to make right. that especially effective. Well, I think that's important even in looking at the 12 <clears throat> promises and maybe the one I was pointing out as a kid, this, because sometimes you, people can get into this kind of uh, magical thinking that if I do these things, then I'm I, I get my ticket punched nine first Fridays, and here's my ticket, St. Peter, uh, you know, I'm getting mm -hmm. in. It's really, that has to be an outward sign of an inner conversion that's gone on in your life, right? I and think likewise it's a start. for this, right? You know, yeah. even if uh, somebody goes there, it, at least it's a start. Right, right. And the Lord can work with that. It does need to be something that's inner, uh, an inner conversion. Well, you're right, right, because by being there, at least there's some <clears throat> level of openness. Right, and there's some prayer going on, and hopefully there's some uh, devotion that's being expressed there. Um, Obviously, our, our faith is not something that is imposed on us. It's right. something that there has to be some freedom of choice. Right. Yeah. Well, it says the two most important aspects of the enthronement are Christ's kingship and his friendship. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we kind of get the kingship part. You were talking right. a little bit about that before and the benevolence of this. How do you see his friendship? How have you found that in your own life? Really, it's what makes our faith alive. Mm -hmm. You know, whether we have our teachings of the church and not every teaching that Christ gave to us is easy to live. <clears throat> and so many people just say, well, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to go through the, the difficulties of that. Mm -hmm. But this is where this intimacy, this friendship with the Lord gives you the grace and the ability to be able to live as Christ wants us to live and to have life abundantly, life to the full, to have that freedom of the children of God. So really, I think there has to be that heart element of our faith if it's going to be something that's living. Mm -hmm. Now I noticed in, in the section of <coughs> growing in love for the Sacred Heart, first I looked on this page and I saw this whole litany of things, ten different things, morning <coughs> offering, daily <coughs> prayer to the Sacred Heart, Holy Rosary, conversation <coughs> with our reading the Gospels, acts of reparation, Holy Sacrifice, and I'm thinking, oh, there's a lot. <laughs> right. of I'm taking on a lot here, but then on the other side of the page, I saw something that it gave me hope. And it talked about besides praying together as a family and sharing with him the joys and sorrows of our common experience, he also says the idea of that little aspiration mm -hmm. during the day, Sacred Heart of Jesus, I love you, or Sacred Heart of Jesus, I trust you. Yeah, those little prayers, and Mother often recommended those as well, just those short little prayers during the day. You know, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I know somebody who actually used that acronym for a license plate. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is that you? <laughs> no, actually our producer, Lisa. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it's those little heartfelt, and St. Teresa of Avila said, those little prayers make the heart warm. You know, that when we offer those little prayers, Jesus, I love you. Uh, Jesus, I love you, save souls. Or Jesus, I'm all yours. Mm -hmm. Those are they're, Those are very good, just those little moments during the day when we can take a break, just shortly lift our minds and our hearts to God and uh, receive His grace and honor Him. And what is, there's actually a daily prayer to the Sacred Heart, right? Right, it's recommended that uh, you have a daily prayer to the Sacred Heart. It's on Heart. page 84 here. Um, it's not something that's obligatory, you know, it's, it's, it's recommended that it could be something helpful to just keep that 
devotion to the Sacred Heart alive. Because once we do something, we can tend to forget it. You know, and that's why the church annually has these celebrations to remind us, like we have mm -hmm. the, you know, the season of Lent and the Easter and all of these things that annually remind right. us because we tend to forget. And so it's a way to keep it alive in our, our minds and our hearts. Well, I thought it was interesting too, in the beginning of the book, uh, Cardinal Burke kind of <coughs> makes the connection with some the enthronement of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. A lot of times we hear they kind of put together Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary. How do you see the connection for someone who's devoted to the Sacred Heart? She's the perfect disciple. You know, she always was faithful to the Lord, and we see that in every word recorded of hers in the Scriptures. Do whatever He tells you. Mm -hmm. I am the servant of the handmaid of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let it be done to me according to your word. She was always there from the beginning of His life to the end. And even the beginning of the church's life, His body, she's with the church, assisting with her prayers and intercession. So typically, people will enthrone the Sacred Heart and then also have an image of the Immaculate Heart too, so that Mary can teach us how to be more perfect disciples and how to love Him more perfectly. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned when we were talking about the promises of the Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. and I kind of went through some of them. There's some other ones in there that people can read themselves, you know. Soon as you'll find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. It's kind of a, a precursor, yes. you, know, uh, you know, a preview of what was coming with the Divine Mercy mm -hmm. uh, devotion. But you mentioned this one um, about the idea I <clears throat> give to priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. Again, I ask you without putting you on the spot, have you found that that has helped you as a priest in doing just that? I've been surprised, and of course, I have a wonderful opportunity to preach to the nations, literally. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and I've been surprised by some of the responses of people how they've been affected through my instrumentality, however the Lord wants to use me. And even people that sometimes uh, in a non-televised uh, way, uh, when I've offered Mass and preached, how people will come up and say, you know, when you said this, it really affected me, it really hit home. And I would say to myself, I never said that. Right. You know, so really? sometimes the Lord will even right. use you but you don't even remember saying those things, or maybe you even didn't, but the Lord spoke to their heart. And that, that's what they heard, right? right? Let me ask you one quick question as we're, as we're running out of time. There's a beautiful image uh, on page 40, <clears throat> particularly one of the Sacred Heart. Is there one image that you're supposed to use? Is there an official image? No, it's, uh, I, but I would choose, when you're going to enthrone the Sacred Heart, choose something that has some artistic merit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, bad art out there too. <laughs> <laughs> and you want something that's going to kind of inspire devotion in you. Right. Something that moves your own heart would be helpful and it will kind of draw you into that intimacy with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Father Joseph, for, for all you do for all of us here at EWTN, certainly for the viewers, but especially for the people who work here. My I pleasure. really appreciate you helping us out as our chaplain and thank you for talking today about the Sacred Heart, and we're talking here with, of course, our chaplain, Father Joseph Mary Wolf, about the enthronement of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and it was put together by His Eminence Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, this particular book that talks about this, published by the Marian Catechist Apostolate, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. We highly recommend you consider doing this and picking up this book. I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Book Walk.